fear. You can't let fear stop you from moving forward or keeping you back from from what your creativity really is and what uh, the power that you have inside of you to impact other people. It's fear, doubt, and worry to me are some of the biggest things that people who are entrepreneurs and running their own business run into. And you've just got to push the fear aside. You're listening to the Creatorpreneur Podcast, Episode 7, and today we're talking to Jane Button, creative entrepreneur and educator who turned a knitted hat into a $5 million company. And today she's going to give you the blueprint to turn your creative products into a thriving business. So stay tuned. Hello, my name is Rodney Washington, author, artist, and entrepreneur, and I'm passionate about helping creatives just like you do what lights you up and make a comfortable living while doing it. Each week, I'll be sharing timely business growth, marketing, and mindset hacks in interviews with courageous creative entrepreneurs to inspire you to get paid for your creativity. So grab your favorite beverage, sit back, and enjoy today's show. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by my free audio book and PDF, Get Paid for Your Creativity, 57 Ways to Monetize Your Gifts and Create True Security for Yourself. To get your hands on a copy of the free audio book and PDF, go to getpaidforyourcreativity.com forward slash 57 ways gift. Welcome back to the podcast. I am super excited to have my first interview guest actually on the show. And this is uh, the person I'm introducing you to today is Miss Jane Button. I actually connected with her through a Facebook group that I uh, actually a pop up Facebook group, actually, that I joined a few weeks ago for a program about Instagram. And Jane was one of the members of the Facebook group. And we connected and started having a conversation. And I learned some really fascinating things about her. And I immediately felt like she would be the perfect first person to have as an interview on the show. So I'm really excited to have her here. She's going to share a lot of really great things uh, for you today, especially if you're in the creative product business, Uh, anything to do with like maybe clothing or furniture or apparel or any, you know, anything along those lines. She's got some great tips and suggestions and ideas for you that I think are really going to help expand your mind about what's possible for you. And I think it's, again, I think it was a perfect first interview. So I'm really, really excited to have her here. Now we're going to jump right into in just a moment. I just wanted to give you a little heads up uh, that the first five minutes of our interview together, we had a little bit of an audio issue. So it's a little bit of reverb that you will hear um, in in her voice in the first five minutes of our interview. And then we were able to clear it out for the remaining five, for the remaining of the, uh, of the interview. So I just wanted to give you a heads up so that you'll be aware of that, that it's not the whole interview, it's just the first five minutes. But again, all of it, the details are there, the information's there, the, it's really a good, a really good introduction. And again, we were able to catch it right away. So we did we're able to get that all fixed up. So the remainder of the interview is going to be really clear, but the first five minutes, just be a little patient with us and um, hope you enjoy it. Again, I'm really excited to share this with you today. And I think you're going to learn a whole lot, take a lot of notes. And even if you don't even do pro- sell creative products, maybe you do services of some sort, maybe you're a graphic designer or a photographer, you're still going to learn a lot about systems and timing And just thinking positively, it's going to help you a lot as you go into your own journey of creating your own, uh, your own business, your own creative business. So I'm really excited to have her here. Let's jump right into it. I'm here today with Jane Button, founder of the Creative Product Blueprint, and I'm thrilled to have her on the podcast today because I know many of you listening do have physical products that you do sell, like jewelry, clothing, artwork, perhaps even food or culinary items, and you might be a little challenged in figuring out the ways to get it out there, especially online. And, um, you know, since she's going to be sharing a lot about how to do that today, and I'm really excited to have her here. I uh, first discovered Jane last uh, about last week, I think, on a uh, um, 
I can't remember his name, but oh, Tyler J. McCall's program on how to sell on Instagram. And that's how we connected. And then I joined her group and I've been following all the great things that she's doing. And as I said, I know a lot of you listening do have physical product. So when I discovered her and what she does, I immediately had the inspiration to ask her to be a guest on the show. So I'm so excited to have to have you here, Jane. So um, I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, this is great. I'm really looking forward to it. So I know you've got a lot of great, great juicy stuff to share with us. So I'm just going to get right into it. So Jane, tell us a little about, tell us a little about yourself. How did you get started in your own creative business? What did you start out doing? I got started by accident, probably like so many other creative entrepreneurs. What happened was um, I decided that I wanted my kids to go to private school. And that was cool. My husband was like, okay, but you pay for it. <laughs> so I, I decided that I would go back into my creative process that I love to sew, I like to knit. So I kind of uh, came up with a product idea and I decided I'd make hats. And so I started making hats and I went to a couple of craft shows and I sold some hats and I quickly realized that I was not gonna make the kind of money that I needed to make to send my kids to school. So I, what I did was I took those products and I went to a local store and I sold them $1,600 worth of that. And that was great. Um, it really got me going and I was selling them for the same price as what uh, I was selling them for at the craft show, but it was wholesale and not retail. And so I didn't, nothing really made any difference in terms of how I was selling it, what kind of money I would be making. And from then on, I mean, I had a nice little studio in my basement. I made everything myself. I handled everything myself. And then I got an appointment to visit Nordstrom. And that was the most life-changing event that ever happened. Like I went to Nordstrom, I got there, and I wasn't seeing one buyer. There were three buyers, and they kind of got in a little huddle. And the next thing I knew, I had all these purchase orders in my hand. And I went home, and my husband and I sat down on the floor, spread them out, added them up, and it was $40,000. And that was like, oh my gosh, this means I'm real. I'm a real business now. And so I needed to figure out systems and all of that sort of stuff. And during the time period from when I got that order um, to when I delivered it, my husband was diagnosed with a malignant brain tumor. And this really, I mean, it, it shattered my life. Um, I wanted to quit. I wanted to be able to spend all my time with him and he sat me down and he said Jane <laughs> you're not going to let this go this is an opportunity for you you may need that opportunity in the future and so let me help you let's get it done let's keep it going and we did and so he he kind of helped me um, he had uh, another job which they let, let him go almost immediately after he was diagnosed and that's another story. But um, so I continued on uh, until he died uh, three years after that. And I, so I stayed fairly small, uh, probably at the $100,000 level for a year. And then I got on a plane and I went to New York and I hired a sales rep. And from there on in, what happened was I went from in my basement studio to close to a $5 million business. Um, and I learned a lot of stuff along the way. So that's my story. <laughs> and, and so uh, once I sold, I sold the business, I stayed on for a couple of years. And after that, people started asking me, gee, Jane, can you help me? I got this, I got that. And I went, wow, yeah, I can do that. And I realized how much I knew and how much I understood product industry businesses versus other types of businesses. So ever since then, I, I've been consulting and working with clients in many different ways. 
to help them take their products to market and get not only traction, but get some success and the growth that they want. That's right. Amazing. So, and I know so many people listening are going to go, wow, is that, you know, is it, is it possible for me to do something like that? Um, and you did say that people started asking you, which I think is so great because I, I feel that all of this for us, our journey with all of this should be very organic. And we start out doing something to express ourselves. We have some success. People are watching what we're doing. They're seeing what, what we're doing. And then they immediately ask us, how did you do that? How, you know, can you help me? So this just segues seamlessly into shifting your focus from creating your own product, or maybe you still do, I'm not sure, um, to helping other creative product designers or creative owners do their own thing. Um, when did you decide to really just take this on full time? Well, I probably decided um, around 2005 to take this full time. In the meantime, I, I ha- have had other product-based businesses And I had another business that went from totally different industry that went from zero to um, a couple of million dollars in sales. Um, And so I think I've learned a lot. I also love that um, one of the things I think that I can really help people with is starting small because I can relate to that. I didn't have Uh, a lot of money to invest in a product. I didn't have a a lot of of, uh, extra time for doing things. I needed things to be easy. And I had two little children that I also needed to spend time with. And so let me just flip into one thing that I think is incredibly important. And that is Um, where to start um, and picking the right product because sometimes people get pretty grandiose and they start a business and they think they can do all sorts of things all at once. So I think it's really important to focus. When I started, I started with a hat. Yes, it came in other colors and designs and all of that, but it also met with my sort of my creative uh, juices in that I liked knitting. I didn't know how to use a knitting machine, I soon learned, but, uh, and it, I did do it, and it, but it had enough creativity within that one hat. Also, the other thing is that um, financially it was easy to do. It was easy to buy yarn. I found the place to buy it, um, wholesale pretty quickly. And so it, it wasn't a huge expense in making those um, first products. And the other thing is there was a need in the market. And that's kind of critical. Is there a need? Is your product different than somebody else's product that is similar? Or is it so much the same that it, you're going to look like a commodity? And that's kind of a critical piece um, when you're when you're in the first part of the development stage of your business. And if you're not, go back and look at it. Are you are you appearing to be a commodity, um, or are are you meeting the needs of a certain group of people? You know, I love that you shared that piece, and I think this is an area in particular where creatives can struggle a little bit because the the act of creation feels so natural to us. It's it's a natural expression of us. But then when we take it out into the world um, to, in order to sell, we have to get others' feedback right. and their take on it. And some can be resistant to that feedback if it doesn't align with the way they want to express themselves or ourselves, I should say. Um, how do you, how do you advise maybe someone coming to you that is in that mindset space where this is coming from my heart, this is what I do and the market's not responding to that? How do you bridge that between 
being purely well, an expression and then the market needs that what people will buy, what you're selling? Yeah, I, uh, one of the first things I do is I have, I have people do research on their product and because sometimes they haven't done any research on other businesses and then they get on a platform such as Etsy and they find out there are all kinds of people doing the same things and they thought they were unique and then they get um, they kind of get upset and I'm like okay no don't get upset how how can your product um, how can you separate yourself what kind of thing can you do to make it different and how you don't do the research so you can be like them but so you can be different than they are mm -hmm. if if that makes sense and if they have sometimes it's that they have too many products too many SKUs in what they are offering and i always say a confused buyer always says no if you have too many options then it confuses people and they don't buy anything so therefore maybe it sounds counterintuitive but to go backwards and focus your line on on similar products and just certain things look at what is selling as much as what is not selling and start eliminating things from your line it's easier for people to buy uh, it's also easier for you as either a maker or a manufacturer and or if you're outsourcing your manufacturing far easier much less expensive so do it that way and then slowly start adding in more products as as the growth comes about so people start wanting something new and let me just say one thing about that <laughs> something new don't have the same things up all the time don't be selling the same stuff um, all the time because if you're always selling the same thing and never offering anything new then that too is a detriment to the sale process because people want to see things that are new and fresh and shiny. Yeah, yeah. And I also heard, I've also been recently hearing a lot about, not that you don't want to keep your product line fresh and updated and trying new things and focusing in the beginning on one product, one type of, one type of item, and then expanding on the options for that kind of item, but also that our story and, and even who we are and how we came into things also can be a part of what differentiates us from Absolutely. other people. I, I agree, Rodney. Um, and people buy from people. And when they hear and see your story, then, um, and they relate to you, then they wanna buy from you. And a, a lot of other things don't matter. They can relate to your story. And just a, you know, a, a side thing is when I started, you didn't tell your story. You know, nobody wanted to know. It was only the, like the store that was selling it. Um, People didn't buy from people back when I started, but they do now. And it's important to keep up with what is, what's going on in the marketplace now. So pe people want to hide and not tell their story. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't help. It only, it only hurts your business in the long run. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I love that you share that because it made me think about, I was watching, um, and I'll mention this in the show notes, uh, Tyler J. McCall, who is an Instagram expert, and this is again how I connected with Jane, and I was listening to uh, one of the recordings of his, he's in the middle of a launch right now for his uh, program, but anyway, he shared uh, in his email last night, I saw of a young lady who's a painter who is bipolar, and he actually said, you know, you shouldn't, and a lot of people said, well, you should just hide that. Don't tell anyone about that. And she actually, not only did she put it out there, but she changed her Instagram bio to actually say she's a bipolar painter or bipolar artist. And since she's been talking about that and sharing her process, and as people love, love to see 
a creative's creative process and how you actually produce and make things. So when she was sharing all of that and telling people about her, you know, her bipolar status, it actually increased sales dramatically. I think he said she sold something like $50,000 worth of paintings last year uh, because she started talking about that. So um, this goes into the, the thing that I've always felt that some creatives we tend to want to do is we want to hide behind our art. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and I, I, and I think I love that story about being bipolar. And I, I remember when I start, first started coaching and consulting, I didn't want to tell anybody that I was, I was widowed and my husband died and, and um, I thought it might upset my children or something. And I finally, I asked them and they said, mom, of course not. That's who we are, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, um, and so I, I tell that story and people relate to it. They relate to me working in, in my basement um, and staying up from, I work from eight o'clock at night till three in the morning. They relate to that. They get it. And when people can relate to you and your process, then they, they tend to, to buy more and they, they feel compelled to, um, to keep, keep looking at you and listening to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have always found I'm a photographer myself. And I remember uh, years ago, I had a friend of mine that did, um, he had this thing he used to do back in the day when he used to have MySpace. <laughs> this is how long ago this yeah. was. <laughs> but uh, he had a thing called Sunday Morning Mimosa. And he would post um, pictures from his recent photo shoot. And, and it was kind of like a gathering thing that people would get together on Sunday morning and he would talk about this, you know, these pictures. And it actually began, he began, began selling. That's how he began by accident selling prints. He wasn't trying to sell anything. He was just excited about having mimosas and thought the idea could connect with his photographs. And that's what he started to do. And he built up an audience that way. Yeah. You know, and so what I love about all of this is that this is an encouraging, and I think probably one of the most key marketing things that we can do is to share ourselves. I think I know personally that I'm fascinated behind an artist process. I, I want to know what you're doing and how you're doing it. It just, it makes me feel like I have some ownership in right. what you're creating. So when you offer something for sale, you're not having to sell it. I'm doing air quotes here with my fingers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, it sells itself. And I think that that's where I, the one thing I feel very strongly about is for creative entrepreneurs, creatives, we have to get out of this thing about I have my creative hat and then I have my business hat. Right, right. I I really agree. When it, when it just triggered my memory when you were talking about that process. When uh, when we developed the, when my name company name was Warm Heart, and when we grew and we added on we added on sweaters and then we added on clothing and all of that. And our process was very interesting how we worked. We, we had four seasons a year, which is, I, I must have been insane to do that. But that meant new products coming out four times a year to sell to stores, to manufacture, to sell and all of that. But we would come out with certain um, sign lines that we would go through. And we would create storyboards on how we were going to do that. The first thing in the process was what are we, what is the uh, line gonna be around? So it was uh, coordinated sports clothes for kids. So it was all centered around the sweater. That was the main piece. So we would come up with the sweater first and then add the pieces. We would add and subtract and each storyboard had a theme to it. And so it was it was like an artist's palette like how are we going to choose what colors um are the kids going to want what are they what's new in the kids world what are kids interested in but we wanted kids the whole process was that children should be children and i um 
I hope this is okay to say, but we used to call them Barbie hooker clothes. <laughs> um, and that, that's the, and I didn't want to dress my kids that way. And our, uh, as a company, we wanted the kids to still be kids. Um, and so that's how we kind of came up with our, how we were going to do things. But um, yeah, that's perfect. And that, you know, again, I, I've said it a million times before is that the, uh, the, the running of the business, the, the marketing, the, all of the sales, all of that is one of the highest forms of creativity. If you apply that same creative energy to how you share your message and get out of the thing about, oh, I don't want to deal with business. You know, you actually get so much further ahead. And I don't think, I mean, obviously, yes, there's the things like doing the taxes and, you know, who wants to deal with all of that? <laughs> but, you know. Well, it, the, well, okay. Let me just talk about numbers for half a second here. Yes. Is that um, nobody wants to do the taxes if you're a creative. Um, and I think one of the hardest things that I have to do is as a consultant is to make sure that people know their numbers and that they so they they can go back to they know what her, their costs of goods are they know um, what what the manu manufacturing process is what the timing is all of those different things that are really critical in understanding where the money is going because the ultimate result is not only do you want to sell your work, um, but you also want to be profitable at the same time. That was really hard for me in the beginning. I had um, a friend of mine who came over and he was look. he knew I had this order and I was doing all sorts of things and he was an accountant and he looked at me and he said, well, um, how's your cash flow? And I looked at him with this like blank look like, what is cash flow? <laughs> mm. <laughs> I had no idea. And I, I really had to learn that. He was right. I had to learn that really quickly about the, when money was coming in, when it was going out. I didn't want to borrow money to grow the business. And so it was really important that I nail all of those things. And I... Eventually, I, I outsourced that. I found somebody who's good, who was good at, at numbers. But I personally had to understand what my cost of goods were for every single product that I did so that I could make a profit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, and you said uh, you said something that I think is really important is that, you know, we don't have to be an expert at everything. And I know coming from the uh, the the do it yourself mentality, because you are the one creating the, the work in the beginning. Um, it's very natural that we would think, OK, well, I'll do my own books and all of that kind of thing. But I've always been told that the first person you hire is a good bookkeeper. <laughs> yeah, the first uh, the first person I hired was somebody to clean my house. So that, uh. <laughs> because my, my studio was in my house. And so that I didn't, and, and then I, after becoming a widow, especially when I, I didn't want to spend my time doing those kinds of things. I wanted to spend my time being, able, being flexible and being able to go to my kids' school programs and all of that stuff. And so that was, but the second person I hired was a bookkeeper and I hired a bookkeeper after I already had an accountant, but that was critical to me to be able to, um, to be able to do that. Yeah. Fantastic. So let's talk a little bit about, um, I know you have some processes and you do have a program that you're going to introduce to us in a little bit, but I, I want to let you share maybe a few key steps, a few key areas that um, creative entrepreneurs listening should start to get their mind around in order to be able to take what they're currently doing, say they're starting out just like you, very grassroots, how you were in the beginning, to whatever the next level is, whether it's selling retail in the stores, and I'd love to talk about selling online if you want to talk about that a little bit. So um, sure. I'll let you choose the topic, the areas you want to think that are really essential um, for someone. Let's say we're starting out someone brand new, they're in the very beginning stages. What would you tell them if they came down and sat and had coffee or tea with you? 
Okay. Um, well, the first thing uh, I would say with what we, I think we started out today was talking about um, picking the product. And I'm not going to go into that further, but, uh, mm -hmm. but that part, uh, that portion is, is I think, uh, pretty critical in picking the right product that matches your, your budgets, a budget and meets your own personal criteria. Um, so that you can get started. Um, and then really, let's see, the, um, the second thing is to really to go through the product development stage. And this can, if you're brand new and don't have a product already out there, it's really um, important to go through that process. Now, my background is in the apparel and knitting world, which um, can be more complicated than other um, kinds of products, but it's it sometimes product development. It doesn't happen overnight. It, it there is a process that you need to go through. It can take um, anywhere from a couple of months to I've seen people develop products over. The, it's taken them a year to get them from brain out out into the world and into the marketplace. So that part is important. Um, you may not know everything about that particular industry. And so that's, that's time to, to really find out what the development is that you need to, to go through. And one of the things I really highly suggest in, during this stage is to get, start a journal. And in this journal, and I, something as simple as a three ring binder is and get some tabs in there and all of the like if you go through swatches or you find a vendor or you see an idea it's like a big book that holds everything this becomes your bible and if you start from that from the beginning you can always look back and see your notes but a binder is fine you don't have to have a fancy um high-priced notebook just get three ring binder and get started because you'll thank me later. Honestly, this was something that was incredibly important to go through that, that stage. Um, and I think this is something that's important uh, is staying away from distractions, learning to focus, 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 and prioritize on what needs to happen next and concentrate on the revenue producing activities and don't get sidelined with all of the other noise that's out there and that's sometimes hard to do um and have you ever had that happen <laughs> oh every single day <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean sometimes the next thing you know it's you're into something four hours and you had no idea that you you've gotten um distracted and you know you go flip from one thing to another so yeah especially social media which can, especially yeah. social media and turned off you know one thing that i found when i was in that process and i still use it to this day is i set a timer and uh and set a timer and only focus on one activity i started with like 15 minutes and i'd say i'm going to spend 15 minutes on this activity and it worked. And I, I really was able to train myself to stay on point and, and stay on that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that gets me into another step that I love. I have a course called Timing is Everything and it's a method that I developed um, in my product business when one day I was, I had all of it. I couldn't get orders out. I was missing stuff. I, I had, I was just a mess. And at, at that point, I still had my business at home. I had taken over um, about half the house, it seemed like. And so I stopped everything for two days and I started a process. And I've since called it timing is everything because seasonal businesses, which all products are, if you miss a season, you can miss a year. And so I, here's what I started with, is a brain declutter. 
Um, you can call it a brain dump or whatever, but getting all of your brain on paper. And this is such a powerful exercise to do. And if you've ever done that, it can be life changing because you see everything that's going on that you're working on and it can it can really change how you look at stuff how can one person do all of this or how can two people do all of this how can i survive but um it's a great start and my next step in that is i have put uh have people put that into a um into a plan so they, we take that and go into a plan um, and we create a mind map of your life. So very, very powerful. I love that. And it's very creative too, that, that which, how you yeah. develop that. I like that. So it speaks to that creative mind that wants to have multiple ways to express. Yes, it does. It, 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 and that's why I do it that way because you can, you can have your mind map up on the wall. I always have people do it in writing and not use a computer, but to get one of those great big giant sticky notes and create it that way. And when you look at that, you see what your brain looks like. And then mm -hmm. you start taking each piece and you turn that into the various processes that you have to, to go through. Um, and so that exercise, it can take, it can take several days or a week, what, whatever, um, to go through that entire process of doing it, but it's well worth it because you come out on the other side, really knowing what your plan is. That's great. And also too, again, as we talked about a moment ago, at some point, your goal is to be able to bring in support to help you. And so if everyone can be on the same page and see yes. what you're doing, you don't have to spend so much time having to explain so much. Um, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Great. That's, I love this. This is great. This is good stuff, Jane. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's one of the things that, um, people, this is one thing when, after they go through that process, they, they say, well, I'm, I need to hire some, I, I, you know, I'll say something like you maybe outsource that. Oh, I don't have enough money to outsource. Well, here's what I learned from one of my mentors from a while ago. And it's so true. You don't have the money to outsource because you're not outsourcing. And when you, I mean, think about that is that when you are constantly taking that time to do a task over and over and over again that you could outsource, then why aren't you spending the time on what is, what's really important to your business or what's in your area of expertise, what your brilliance, you're not spending time there. And when you create the mind map, as you chunk it down, you can make other mind maps with processes that you're doing. And then you can, as you just said, hand that over to somebody, show them what that process is, or take it and then write it down. Mm -hmm. And you know, and while we're talking about that, this is something I want to add on to that, because I, I know of whom you're speaking, your mentor. And um, the thing that I really want people to hear is that when we say outsourcing, bringing in someone to support you, we're not saying you need to go out and hire someone full time. No. That's going to be with you 40 hours a week and you've got to give them benefits and all that other kind of thing. Not at all. I mean, it might even be five hours a month or five hours a week or whatever. Right. But it makes a huge difference because your time is not spent doing the stuff that is taking away from what's actually generating income to pay that five hours to someone. Exactly. And one of the other things that I outsourced um, was my manufacturing. And I didn't bring anybody in-house. Um, what I did was I sat down and it was, it was very challenging for me to do this. And I wrote out how to put the patterns on the sweaters and how to knit them. You know, and as I was creating that process, 
I actually, I was knitting a sweater in a certain size range uh, and I would write it down as I was doing it. It took a long time, but in the end, I was able to delegate that knitting to people who lived at home and had a knitting machine. And so I would give them the yarn and the pattern, how many I needed, what sizes, and they would knit them and bring them back to me. And that was, it was amazing because it gave me more time to design and market. I always love that quote, uh, money can be managed, people can be managed, schedules can be managed, time can only be accounted for. Mm -hmm. uh, I love that. I love that. So let's see. So I think really you really, you kind of gave, we talked about outsourcing and we were talking about right. hiring people and feeling like you can't hire people. And, but you did say something that I actually wanted to expand, talk okay. about a little bit more was you said a process, which I know some people are going to have some struggle with this, but um, you said you documented your process yeah. and that you were able to then hand that off. Um, and to me, this is the beginning stages of setting up systems. Right. And it's a thing that I know the, the creative mind can tend to be resistant because it seems like it's so many, um, it's so much structure around it, but it actually is very freeing. I feel to it, it do is. that. So could you I, talk about that some more? Yeah, that'd be great. It can be a challenge, but um, as you were saying, it can be really freeing in the end to have systems because when you, when you allow yourself a lot of different choices on ways to do things or how to operate your business, it really cuts down on the growth. So um, from the get-go, I really, um, I, I started the systems and I started it when I got that $40,000 order because I knew that I couldn't make all of those hats myself. I had to go and find people to make them. And I had always kept my pretty much how I was doing things in my head. Um, and so I had to get those onto paper and because I had to give people a pattern. Now I knew what a knitting pattern looked like, so I drew it out, but I went to my knitting books to look for how instructions were written. And so what mm. I did was I created those first processes based on say Vogue Knitting Magazine, which was I thought was notorious for getting things not exact, but it gave me a framework um, to go by and start with. And so I knit the hats, and what I did was I went through, okay, they don't have to know how to knit each hat. I need to have a framework for how to knit the basic hat. I had two designs. One had ear flaps, one didn't, but they were different. So basic hat and then separate instructions on where to insert the pattern. But I had to sit down with each one and it took me a long time to do, but that was the beginning. And as I grew the business, I realized that everything was the, was the process, the ordering process, the design process, the um, process of how we were going to, when we were gonna uh, deliver things, how we were going to ship, uh, how we were gonna box things up, how we were gonna pack. So there were systems that were created. So let me just say on shipping, two-step process. One person picked off the shelves, the other one packed because that automatically set up a, a system where one could check out the other one. So it eliminated any returns, pick and then pack. And because returns can be really hard to deal with. You don't want returns. You want everything to go out and be perfect. So a process, the order process, when an order came in, where did it go? Uh, how did it get fulfilled? Um, 
what if we were out? Now, now you can have a Shopify site that'll tell you you have your inventory in there. Um, but if you're selling wholesale, um, it how to, do I have enough to actually create an order? Do I have enough orders? Gathering of the orders during certain time periods. So if I'm selling um, products to be delivered in the fall, uh, end of August, in, and in September, then when am I going to need to get those orders in order to fulfill them? How long, how long am I going to allow for the manufacturing process? For us, it developed over time. January, February, biggest months for selling wholesale to stores. And then delivery uh, could be in July when, when stores were opening up early for the back to school. So we had to set up a timeline. So if we missed shipping them, they canceled their orders. So it was incredibly important that we stay on deadline and that we make those. And I made mistakes along the way, big time. We were in the Nordstrom catalog once and we hadn't gotten our order back from our manufacturer uh, in time. And we had one night to go and everything came in and it was wrong. We had to do correct things, tear off labels, put them in. Sizing was, the sizes they had were all wrong. And so, um, that really showed me like, okay, we have to back up. We can't let this ever happen again. Um, so that it, it happens. Yeah. And when you have something like that happen, you learn quick. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. Because it, it was, it was a large order and not only was it not just going to get into the stores, but it was coming out in their catalog. And so oh how can you have, a product that's going to be dropped in a catalog and then not have it ready to go. Wow. Wow. And you're still here to tell the story. So. I'm still here. <laughs> and they still ordered. They loved it. You know, they had no idea what was the chaos behind the scenes. Behind the scenes. And that's the thing, you know, and I'll say this is that we can't be afraid of things like that happening because I mean, yes, that, that is a highly stressful uh, situation, but you know, it's life. I mean, if you had a job with someone else, you're going to have something like that happen. You're going to have to deal with as a part of being on the team. So we can't avoid it because it's our own business and we should never have to go through any stresses and everything should be smooth and, you know, and hot chocolate and kittens every day. It's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, and Rodney, fear. You can't let fear stop you from moving forward or keeping you back from from what your creativity really is and what uh, the power that you have inside of you to impact other people. It's fear, doubt, and worry to me are some of the biggest things that people who are entrepreneurs and running their own business run into. And you've just got to push the fear aside. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you do, and I heard, I heard someone say this, and it, it might have been your mentor, uh, you do it afraid. Yeah, I think a, a lot, of, I've been doing it afraid for a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and, the, and you yeah. know, and I think about it on a deeper level, Jane, I mean, you know, we, we honestly do it every day afraid, whether we're doing it for ourselves or we're doing it for someone else. Um, you know, we may not always realize that part of what we're experiencing, how we're resisting things is that sphere. It might not feel like that heart thumping fear, but that resistance to do things or immediately making judgments that, well, I can't do that, or no one's going to buy that, or, you know, or who's going to, you know, all of those things that come up for us. And that's, that's a form of fear. It may not be that heart thumping, you know, like scared out of my pants kind of fear, but right. resistance is fear. And um, I'm glad you well, brought that up. Do, doing things, well, just like the lady you were talking about earlier with bipolar, it might be fear of somebody discovering who you really are and, mm -hmm. and, and you're, you're not ready. You don't think you're ready to get out that out into the world. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really okay to get that out into the world. And also it's okay if you fail the first time and it's okay if nobody buys it, what did you learn? Um, mm -hmm. If nobody's buying your stuff, 
What if your website's terrible? What if you haven't, you know, what if you don't have great pictures? Just start somewhere right. and get it out there and you learn as you go. Um, I, I and, and that's what I say to people is I started in my, I knew squat about, <laughs> about business. I had a degree in sociology, you know, mm -hmm. um, that did not prepare me to go into business. But, you know, I was, I guess I had a lot of confidence. I, I thought I had good taste. I think that was uh, where, where I started from is, yeah. and, but it never stopped me from going to New York and doing a trade show. It never stopped me from going to New York and um, hiring a sales rep. And meeting with meeting with a rep who was like the best from everybody I had heard about, and he he could have said no, but all I was out was plane fare. So um, yeah, man, a nice trip to New York. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think and you know and I'm glad you brought that up about the young lady, the the the, the artist that's uh, the painter that's bipolar, is that the fear isn't just about something going wrong in or awry in the physicality of your business, but just in putting yourself yeah. out there. And I think for many of us, that's the core fear um, of not wanting to really put ourselves out there again. So it, I feel like if you can get, if you can get past that hump, I mean, I don't know what all of her other areas of her business that she may struggle with, but I feel like if you can put that out there and, actually not only thrive and build an audience, I think you can deal with almost anything else. If you can Absolutely. take that most personal thing about yourself that you would think no one wants to hear that or I would never share that, you can get past that. You can pretty much deal with all of the day-to-day the -day mishaps that do happen in the running of the business. So, mm -hmm. Now, Jane, I want to ask you really quickly, and we haven't talked about this a lot, is the online aspect of uh, offering a creative product-based business. Um, can you share a little bit about that? I know we talked a little bit about Etsy, um, having your own website. How, how does someone, you know, I mean, how do, you've been talking a lot about the wholesale end of it, which is great, but I know a lot of us are going to be wanting to know about the online. Yeah, aspect. yeah. And, and in the olden days when I started, um, you started first by selling to a store. And now it's completely opposite. If you want to sell uh, to a store eventually, to me, the best place to start is by having your own presence online and really uh, getting a, a lot of people, a lot of eyeballs on your products, selling a lot of your products, um, either uh, it's selling them online. Um, and that is through, I'm very... Um, adamant about people having their own real estate and that means having your own website and making that as attractive as possible to uh, with your own branding your own style and your own message because that sets the precedent for everything else that you are going to do whether it's um, through social media or whether you use other platforms like amazon or you use um, Etsy, um, places like that. Now, I always say that I probably, if Etsy had been around when I started, I probably would have started there and I would have stayed stuck. And I know people who stay there um, and they don't move forward. You're gonna get noticed far better if you spend the time to have your own real estate that you own and then, um, and then branch out from that space. Mm -hmm. And you know, and I'm so glad that you said that because I have a, a, actually a friend right now who's starting her own jewelry design business and she has some pieces up on Etsy and she's basically said that no traction is really coming of that. But what she did share with me uh, since our last conversation that you and I had, Jane, was that she's been sharing pieces on Facebook. Yeah. And she's been asking people to give her feedback on the piece, not asking them to buy, but asking them to give feedback on the pieces. And people have been giving feedback and then asking to buy. Okay. <laughs> you know the pieces. And that's, and that's, and that's good. You have, social media is social. It's a conversation. And mm -hmm. so that's 
that if that strategy is working, that's great. Um, and the other thing about a Facebook page is there's so much that you can do and show about your own personality as well as your brand. If it's all buy my stuff, buy my stuff, buy my stuff, mm -hmm. then um, people aren't going to buy. They're going to be offended. They want to know about you as, yep. as a designer. Yep. And I think that was one of the things that I have recently discovered again in listening back to uh, uh, Tyler McCall's uh, training is he talks very little about what he sells. It's yeah. more about his life and what's going on and what he's doing and just getting that kind con- like his number one thing. And I'll link to him in the show notes for everyone listening. Okay. Um, he loves Target. <laughs> That's like his number one thing. He loves Target and Ben and Jerry's. And I think he said Real Housewives. <laughs> <laughs> and he talks about those things all the time. And he says, as he positions it, is it's, it's common interest. He wants to connect with people who also enjoy those things. And so when people connect with you because, oh, well, they like Ben and Jerry's and they like this and they like that, I feel a connection to them. And then it's almost like that's sort of the thing he's leading with. Oh, and by the way, I happen to offer this. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Yeah. Now he doesn't have a physical product. However, it's, it's, it's the same kind of a strategy on, um, on what you have that you use in social media, but he, he, and he does have, um, a website and, and that's where like physical product people, one of the big things with having your own website is having really good photography and mm -hmm. descriptions and photography is so important. We used to do big ads. We did spreads in um, uh, some of the children's magazines. There used to be some, and as well as trade magazines. And we always used a professional photographer um, to do that. And if you can't take your own uh, mm -hmm. professional looking photography, hire somebody. It's the best money you'll ever spend. Um, on, on your product. That's just a quick aside. <laughs> yeah. And I'll just share to add to that. As I was saying to Jane, when she and I first connected with one another, um, I photographed product for two retail outlets when I used to live in Los Angeles. And that's what I did. And that was the number one thing was the photography. Uh, you know, when you're selling, well, in these cases was jewelry and clothing. Uh, as Jane was talking about, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. It can be jewelry. It can be food. If it's a physical product, great photography is probably one of the single biggest investments, especially if you have your own real estate, like a website, but especially if you're sharing things on social media, you don't have to have it. I don't think a hundred percent as perfected on social media because there is sort of like people will do this with their cell phone all the time. But if it's on your website, what we call your catalog sheet or your, your lookbook, right. you want those pictures to be really crisp and polished and you want them to look professional. And quite frankly, the higher quality of photography, the higher price point. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, it really, really shows. Now, one, uh, when you were talking about that, one thing on social media, people love to sort of anticipate what's coming up next. And so people who get a lot of people following them on social media, in, on Facebook or even on Instagram, is by showing what, you know, sort of secretively, like, we're working on this for our next season, or, yeah. you know, this is coming, and, and, or showing the process, the manufacturing or making process of what's coming. Um, I have a client uh, who has a bathing suit line, and she'll go... Uh, she takes pictures of working with her um, manufacturer so that they're doing the first samples. And it's just like a little taste and a little hint. And people love that. Yeah. Uh, you made me think of something. There's a video that I found. Uh, there's this line of cashmere scarves that are hand dyed in India. And they have this really beautiful video that is shot of showing the actual dyeing process. Yes. And I'm going to put that link in the show notes. You know, it doesn't have to be as polished as what um, what we're talking about is yeah. what these guys have done. But it's just to give you the, a taste. This can be done with your with your with your with your camera phone, right? You know, it doesn't have to be a production video. But 
showing those behind the scenes and it literally with no words is telling the story of how this scarf was made. And in the product development process, if you're brand new and you haven't come out with your full line yet, um, when you cre start creating an audience in advance of that and showing them like maybe some ideas or going through that process, it really, it pulls people in. And that's what that particular client did was um, she did that before she came out with one bathing suit. Um, she started telling the process of how she got involved in it and her whole story. So mm -hmm. people were fascinated. Mm -hmm. And what we're really sharing here and for all you listening is this is marketing. It is. So that thing that we have in our head about marketing, like, ugh, <laughs> and sales, <laughs> ugh, <laughs> you know. Well, you know what? When I, when I had my, I, when I first started, my real focus was on the product. And I love the creative process. I love the design process of doing that. But as I got further into the business, what I really, what floored me was I loved the marketing part because it was so creative. And I had no idea. Um, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It is. That's the thing. You know, it's just, it's a mindset shift, you know? It is. Yeah, it's not. And I think the reason why, again, so many creatives have such an issue with it is because it feels like the, the, the process of selling is pushing something on someone that doesn't want it. Right. And that's not what's happening. You're not, I mean, clearly if no one has a need for your knitted hat or your painting, they're just not going to pay attention to you. But for someone that has a desire for that, or they might be thinking, you know, I don't really have any kids, but I know friends that are having babies. Maybe they might like one of these hats or whatever it is, fill in the blank, whatever it is that you sell. So um, you're not pushing things on people. Trust me, people, we all have the option to, if it's on online, we click away. If it's not interesting to us, um, or if we're at a farmer's market or a store and it's not our thing, we'll just walk away from it, you know, and not even pay attention to it. So you're not pushing things on people. You're giving them an opportunity to learn about something that will enhance their life. And if they are ready to embrace it, they will flock to you, but you got to get their attention to begin with. Exactly. Exactly. Um, the, the other thing um, that I wanted to say about being online is, is that when, when, you're, when you're online and when you start selling your products online, it will really help you to get ready for that next level. You'll see things that happen in your business. You'll hear people say things. You can, um, once you start growing your list, you can start emailing that list and letting them know when you've got something that's new you can keep in touch by email as well as um in so through social media and that email accounts for um i think uh, somewhere around 70 percent of sales for people who are small businesses yeah i mean hard to believe but it's it's yeah. true and it's the number one thing. That's one of the, the primary things I do in my business now is I help people set up their online presence. And years ago, well before email became like a thing that was a marketing tool, so to speak, I would always tell people you need to have a way to collect people who visit your website because how would they know to come back? Right. You know? Right. And, and even sending them um, direct marketing is, is another way i'm a old school person from dan kennedy era where you sent uh -huh. direct mail pieces um and honestly that 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 still does work postcards work um mm -hmm. if you're going to be in an event contacting people in advance sending them a very large postcard it does work um and using postcards at a trade show or at a uh, market there are lots of festivals and going on and showing that there um, having a postcard is really important. Um, mm -hmm. Something like a, like a calling card. Yeah, and I'm, gl I'm glad you brought that up because I feel like there sh it shouldn't be an either or, either I'm offline or I'm online. Right. I feel no matter if it's a product-based business like what we're talking about today or if it's a service, 
you should have some physical component where you are actually in front of people, um, shaking hands and connecting with people, and then definitely have an online presence to continue the conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that some people get into this thing. Well, you know, if I have an on website, I don't need to go out and actually meet people. And I think you're kind of doing yourself a little bit of a disservice. I I agree. Um, Connecting personally is um, extremely important. I know that when I work with clients uh, live and in person, um, there we get so much done really quickly. But I also encourage people to do things like juried shows um, and events like that because you get out in front of real people and you hear their comments, whether you sell anything or not. That's not necessarily the point as much as getting the reaction from, um, from potential customers and people who are at a show. Um, there's a, a show that goes on. I, I live in Spokane, Washington. Um, and there's, I've been to lots of festivals in my life, but we have one that's a juried show put on by the museum. And that is amazing. And then another one called Farm Chicks, which is, I think people all over the United States know about that one. It's a really big uh, fair that, that goes on for two days. And there's so many people there that get reactions um, to what their products are all about. So mm-hmm. it's yeah. important to be in front of people. It is. And it never has failed for me personally. When I go to anything like that, like a, 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 even a farmer's market, um, a, a fair or a trade show or anything like that, I'm always looking for their cards, postcards, business yes. cards, because when I get home or whatever, I'm going to their website. Right. You know, so they work in tandem. And I think, and for me too, because if we work at home, we're by ourselves. We haven't really talked about the loneliness aspect of running, you know, because sometimes when you're a solo <laughs> entrepreneur, but it can get a little isolating. And I think that getting yourself in front of people is keeps you fresh. And I think it also engages the mind and you get ideas for new things to create. So um, I don't, I just, I can't emphasize it enough as Jane has yes. emphasized is to find you can, there's, I don't care what you're selling. If it's homemade fudge or, or knitted hats or whatever, there is some place that you can go to get in front of people to engage with. Them. I think that was one of the um, biggest challenges I had when I first started out was because I had a um, corporate kind of job previously and I was around people and I went out for lunch and I, you know, I talked to people during the day. And um, so one of the great things now is having social media. So even if you are a solopreneur um, and you're just starting out and you don't have a big staff that you're talking with, um, that you can find groups on Facebook Mm -hmm. and they're free. I have a free group. Um, So you can ask questions. You can um, find out information that you wouldn't necessarily have have access to and you're not as isolated. Yeah. It goes a long way. It really goes a long way. So I can't emphasize it enough. I've really enjoyed so much of what we talked about, Jane. Is there any other uh, uh, points or any other additional, you know, things that we should be looking at to help us get this journey started for ourselves or well, we've talked about an awful lot today. Yeah, we have. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed it. Um, it gets me very excited whenever I start talking about um, uh, business and helping people. Um, and I hope that I have helped in this. So um, I think that the um, maybe the maybe the next thing that I want to say is if you would um, if you would like to. Um, be part of my small group um, on Facebook. It's still reasonably uh, small group. And it's, uh, it's called, um, what is it called? Um, my Don't worry, but let me look it up and I've got it here. And also, I'm going to put the link inside the okay. show notes for everyone okay. listening as well, but I do have the link here. So it's, what um, I'll do the is... The Creative Product Blueprint. The Creative Product Blueprint, yes. And like I said, I will have the link in the show notes. Okay. Just so, I mean, throw this in really quick too, is that you can find the show notes at getpaidforyourcreativity.com 
forward slash 007 for episode seven. And all the links and everything we've talked about will be in there, including links to Jane's uh, Facebook group. And you also have um, something that you want to also share with the listeners. Today. Yeah. I have a, um, a uh, it, it's kind of like an ebook. Um, it's a, and it, it's very helpful with some of the points that I was going through today about the 10 step process. And it has not only goes through the various points, 10, 10 different steps, but it also has assignments, um, things that you can do. And I really encourage you to, um, to grab that. It's free. Uh, and then start going through those, uh, the uh, challenges in there, the different courses, it'll tell you exactly what to do, um, what the assignments that, that are in there. And, Fantastic. and people can get that. I believe the link that we have for that is janebutton.com forward slash creative edge. Yes. And I'll also have the link for that also in the show. Okay. And get paid for your creativity.com forward slash zero zero seven. And you'll be able to access that. What I would recommend you do is that you um, grab that that generous uh, gift that Jane has for you, and then also join her Facebook group, and that way you can get meet the wonderful people inside the group, and maybe even get a little extra nugget from Jane uh, inside the group and share introduce yourself. Definitely do that. I introduced myself in the group and immediately two um, two of your members reached out to me to welcome you to the group. I thought that was really nice. I have not had that happen in other groups I've joined. So the energy already was very welcoming. So you have a, you have a good group of people over there. I think I do. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Join that free group. And um, I always welcome everybody and, and ask you to introduce yourself. So um, the more you, the more you tell about your business, um, the better off, better off you are and the more response you get in the group. Mm -hmm. You get a lot of good support in there. Yeah. So is there any last thoughts that you want to leave the listeners with today, Jane, before we wrap um, up? The, the, I think the best advice I could give you if you're thinking of just starting a business is to do it. Don't try, just do it and start somewhere, start anywhere. Even if you start in the middle, um, it's okay. And um, there are lots of people out there um, to support you and uh, cheer you on. Yeah, absolutely. And again, you know, you don't have to worry if you live in a small community and you're not where, not near a major city. I mean, I've had a client that started her bakery, starting out selling cupcakes at her job in a, in a, in a high tech firm. And that years later grew into a store. So you can start anywhere. There's no absolutely. excuses. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's okay. Start yeah. small, learn. Yeah. Uh, as you go. Yeah, that's absolutely. Well, Jane, thank you so, okay. so much as being thank the you. first guest for the Creatorpreneur podcast. I'm so excited to have you. Like I said, this was really just like, it was so cool because I was just talking to a friend of mine and I said, you know, I'm, I want to interview someone for the show. And like I said, we were both in a Facebook group that is not connected to either one of our groups. <laughs> yeah. And it just intuitively, I got the hit, you know, I should talk to her. And so we connected and my intuition paid off tremendously. So I'm so glad I listened to myself and I reached Thank out you. to you because you've been such a, a joy to talk to. And uh, Thank you so much. So glad to have you. So yeah. I really so, love being here. And um, yeah. So everyone, I hope wherever you are today that you're having a great day and uh, listen to this interview, listen to it again. And again, you know, I'm going to also reference some other shows in the show notes for this episode that can kind of get your mind sort of set around turning your creativity into an idea that you might want to start into a business. And if it does turn out to be a product based business, although I feel like a lot of the things that Jane and I talked about can be applicable, even if it's not necessarily product based, but if you are selling product you definitely want to listen to this a couple of times to get all of that in. And then, like I said, definitely take advantage of her freebie because I think it's going to be a great tool to help you and join that group. If you have any questions, again, 
you know, join, ask, um, check out, you know, what, what we're doing and we're here to support you any way we can, but we're just excited to see creative people do something that lights us up and fills us with passion and express ourselves with purpose every day. So again, I'm so grateful to have you listening. Thank you again, the wonderful Jane Button for joining me today on the show. And we will see you on the next episode of the Creative Podcast. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Take care. We have entered the age of creative self-employment. In the new economy, people are creating true security for themselves. That's why I believe there has never been a better time in history to monetize your gifts. So if you're ready to take control of your financial and creative future, I have something for you. It's my free audio and PDF program, 57 Ways to Monetize Your Gifts and Create True Security for Yourself. And you can get that at my website, getpaidforyourcreativity.com forward slash 57 Ways Gifts.